thanks for joining our Mass Timber March Madness event. I've got a great presentation from Ian. I've known Ian for at least a dozen years. And obviously, with business in Oregon, uh, work with him regularly. What, like another 30 seconds, I believe. We're up to about 50 people already. Yeah, perfect. Um, also want to thank, before we just start, uh, the U.S. Forest Service and the Tallwood Design Institute for supporting this event. Um, we'll take, Ian's going to present uh, the presentation and then take questions and answers uh, after the event. So if you could hold your questions until he's done with his presentation, then we'll have an open discussion. Thank you, and Ian, I'll let you take it away live. Hey, thank you very much, Greg. <clears throat> And uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And thanks, Greg, for, for arranging this event. It's quite the production to have uh, a month of uh, seminars on mass timber. But, um, you know, very much uh, um, there's, there's very much a vibe around the world around this whole thing. And uh, I guess what you're doing here is quite reflective of that. So I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, you should now see. Not, not yet. We're, that's the, there it is. Thank there, you. Right there. Okay. Great. Well, um, I was my, my kind of generic topic today was um, mass timber and the Tallwood Design Institute. Now, I thought that you know many of you might be familiar with uh, TDI and what we do. I'll, I'll I'll introduce us very briefly, but I don't mean to give an infomercial for for TDI today. So rather than that, I I thought it might be interesting to talk about what's been happening on the West Coast and. Um, you know what, I'm gonna to have to close this because um, there's timing on this. So give me one second here. Um, apologies about that, let me just fix this quickly. Okay, hopefully that did the trick. Um, okay, so let me go back in here. So, so um, I'm going to talk about the West Coast and, and developments up and down the coast in terms of mass timber over about the last 10 years. So um, when I think of March Madness, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not, um, uh, I'm not from here. Um, you know, I did spend 20 years in Canada and, you know, our equivalent to March Madness would be uh, the World Junior Hockey Championships when uh, that's just after the Christmas holiday when everybody goes crazy in Canada about, uh, uh, you know, these young hotshots. And then, you know, originally I'm, I'm from Scotland. And so Scotland's equivalent of March Madness would probably be this. This is, um, I should actually ask the question, you know, what do you think this, this is? Um, it's a sport and this is 1979. And it's the Lake of Menteith where um, in a, a rare occasion these days, the, the lake was covered in six inches of ice. And that um, allows you to have what's called a grand match. So, um, People, thousands of curlers take to the ice and have these um, these these games. Um, the interesting thing is this picture on the top left here looks like it's taken from 1856. It's actually 1979. So you can see that um, you know Scotland's not really known for its fashion. You know, um, you know, being on the cutting edge or anything. These are <laughs> some people here from from 1979, but you know they're having a good time. And down here is my dad actually <clears throat> in 1979. Pulling a, a whole raft of curling stones to his next game. So um, that's kind of a, our equivalent there, just to give you a little bit of a cultural um, perspective on things. <clears throat> so I didn't come here to talk about curling or, or hockey. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the director of the Tallwood Design Institute, and we're a, a kind of a unique partnership between two universities in Oregon um, the College of Forestry and the College of Engineering at Oregon State University. They're based in Corvallis, about uh, an hour and a half south of Portland. Uh, and we're partnered with the University of Oregon, which is about another hour south from there on the I-5. Um, and the architecture school is, is the main partner there. So the whole idea is to work across the disciplines of architecture, engineering, uh, wood science, um, forestry, um, to uh, do interdisciplinary work that will help move the industry forward. Um, and 
our overall mandate is really to look at growing the, the manufacturing base for structural wood products and systems within the United States and eliminating barriers and stimulating demand for structural wood products and building systems. Of course, mass timber is a huge part of that conversation these days. Um, and it's important to say that although our, our name is the Tallwood Design Institute, we're not just interested in building taller and taller, you know, wooden skyscrapers. Uh, we really very much see a market for um, non-residential buildings and multifamily buildings of, of many types. Um, you know, I think it's generally accepted that the sweet spot for mass timber is around sort of five to 12 stories um, above the point where light frame is very, very competitive and below the point where steel is, uh, sorry, concrete is very competitive. So, um, you know, we're really interested in that space, but um, we're also um, working on all kinds of other systems. And, you know, the way that we achieve our mission is, is through these kind of four buckets of activities. We do um, a large amount of industry driven applied research. And what I mean by that is that we have a jury that we appoint um, every year to evaluate the, the research proposals that are being submitted by our professors across the, um, the three disciplines in the two universities. And we ask them uh, to, to propose these projects, but we have a, an industry group that, that really evaluates and ranks them. And what we ask the industry group to do is, is look at the, the, the short to medium term impacts in the industry. Now, how, how much is the work that we do, how much is the research that we do gonna move the dial on eliminating barriers to um, appropriate use of wood in the built environment. Um, and if it's not going to move the dial, we don't really want to do that kind of research. So we're a little bit different from, you know, some university programs that are working on more of a fundamental level. Um, we also recently established a research consortium called REACT. So it stands for uh, Research in Engineering, Architecture and Construction of, of Timber Structures. So. Uh, looking at, um, you know, the kind of bleeding edge of, of where wood systems, wood-based systems are going. Um, and, and this is a 17-member industry consortium, um, a members club that pays in membership dues every year and then uses that to um, do, carry out a research and testing program that, that the members decide on. So, so the members set the parameters for the work. Um, we do a lot of product development and testing, so we'll also work with uh, specific uh, developers or manufacturers to test either their products or um, uh, a mass timber assembly system that might be used in a particular building. Um, and many of those have, that data has made its way into the public domain, which is now helping to um, make it easier for um, designers and, and um, architects and, and developers to get uh, their designs permitted. We're quite active on the training and education side, so um, in a range of ways. Um, <clears throat> one is that we're developing an industry-focused certificate program focused on, on industry professionals, and the idea being to try to um, provide um, knowledge and education for people in the workplace already. Um, and we've got courses underway or, or available already on um, the kind of design-build experience with mass timber, uh, we have an introductory e-learning course on mass timber. Uh, we're developing one on construction and installation. We have one um, almost ready on quality control and, and quality assurance in the manufacturing of mass timber and, and, and various other courses on CAD, CAM, CNC, and so on. Um, we're, uh, at, our partners at University of Oregon are developing a, a whole focus area on mass timber in their Master of Science in Architecture program that will start this September. Um, and then we also have a, a keen sort of eye to economic development, how we can influence that. So we're, we're working with uh, state agencies and beyond to try to uh, determine what can be done to um, move the industry forward to stimulate um, more uh, companies to start producing mass timber and to try to encourage the tertiary players that are needed um, in the industry as well, such as the custom uh, CAD and CNC fabricators. Um, so that's really all I'm gonna say about um, Hollywood Design Institute. If you want more information, my colleague Judith Schein will be presenting um, closer to the end of the month, I think around the 20th. Um, and she'll be talking more about uh, some of the examples of the work underway at TDI and specifically about the, the design, the architecture side of things. 
So when we look at, uh, what I want to do is kind of look back at the Pacific Northwest timber traditions. And there's a reason that the, the West Coast has become this kind of leader um, in uh, manufacturing, construction, design of, of mass timber within North America. Um, you know, the, the left one uh, picture is from British Columbia about the 1900s. The, the right picture is the 1850s in Oregon, um, these huge old growth trees that, that sort of gave birth to this um, timber industry that became so dominant in both states. Um, well, I shouldn't call that a um, BC estate. I just, uh, um, you're going to disown me now, but that, that's all good. Um, so let's look a little bit more closely at this. Um, you see British Columbia on the left, um, largest producer of softwood lumber in North America. One out of four manufacturing jobs are in the forest industry. And the forest lands of British Columbia are larger than France and Germany combined. Um, and then we go to Washington and we see also the importance of the industry there, a leading softwood lumber and plywood uh, producer. Um, um, and, and true also for Oregon, you can see that the forested land base is very large in, in each of those states and uh, the number of, of people employed and, and traditionally has just been uh, you know, a driver of the economy in both in BC, Washington and Oregon. The first um, jurisdiction to uh, jump into mass timber in North America was British Columbia. And um, they did an important thing in 2009 with um, the premier of BC, Gordon Campbell, brought in a piece of legislation called the Wood First Act. Now this was um, quite instrumental in getting a lot of wood projects going. Um, it didn't really particularly have a lot of teeth in terms of, um, you know, you know, really enforcing, but basically what it said was if you, uh, you know, if you're building a building that's going to be paid for with provincial government funds, um, then you should propose a wood solution if at all possible or have a good, good reason why, you know, wood solution is not possible. Um, so as I said, there wasn't really any enforcement attached to that, but it did stimulate a lot of, um, proposals for really interesting wood designs. One of the sort of more iconic ones, I guess, is this um, Richmond Olympic skating oval. So it was the skating, the speed skating venue during the Olympics in 2010, um, and then went on to be this, this just amazing uh, community space that's used for a variety of sports now. And it, um, this kind of captured people's imaginations the following year in 2010 with the Vancouver Whistler Olympics. Um, so these venues were kind of showcased on the world stage. And it kind of set off a, a train of, of projects in British Columbia. Um, and really um, helping all that happen was that the first um, mass, the first North American cross laminated timber plant opened in Penticton, BC, um, and that was Structure Lamb. So this is kind of indicative of the, the government at the time's commitment to uh, wood and to driving uh, the economy with, with wood. Um, this is a convention center, a World Trade Center that opened uh, around that time uh, in downtown Vancouver. And then we saw other examples. So the Wood Innovation Design Center in Prince George, which was for a while the tallest mass timber building in North America, uh, designed by Michael Green Architects, and now the home of the uh, University of Northern British Columbia's um, uh, timber engineering program. And then ultimately it resulted after many other buildings and Brock Commons, um, which uh, was an 18 story wood building, which for quite a while was the tallest uh, contemporary wood building in the world. And really um, part of what was happening in the background here was, was this kind of thing. This is Spearhead Timber Works, um, way uh, nine hours east of Vancouver, way in, in a rural uh, location, quite close to the Rocky Mountains. Um, but what started to happen is, you know, that these fabricators around the province were able to use uh, CAD and, and CNC technology to really do amazing freeform thing designs and, and realize these these incredible fabrications that were um, had been very very difficult or impossible to do on a, on this kind of scale um, using just hand tools. So um, the Hundiger K2 in the background, you see uh, quite a lot of those around the province now. Uh, they became kind of the workhorse of the of the timber frame industry, but uh, increasingly used in mass timber as well. And these kind of connections are really difficult to do or impossible to do without, um, you know, computer aided design and computer aided manufacturing. 
let's go to Oregon now. What things started to happen there fairly soon after um, what we just talked about in BC. The government, the governor of the day, um, brought in an executive order in 2012, and and wanted to sort of identify identify some capital construction projects to feature wood. Um, also wanted to examine whether green building rating systems could recognize the benefits of Oregon timber. Um, and other things that are have become fairly common around the world in a number of jurisdictions uh, wanting to examine the use of wood in state buildings and develop a strategy to accelerate um, research and development around wood products. Um, around the same time, 2013, uh, University of Oregon students um, under my colleague Judith Shine's direction uh, entered and won a Timber in the City design competition to propose a sustainable wood solution for um, affordable housing in, in Brooklyn. So things were really happening. And then um, at Oregon State University, which is where our, our lab is based, um, the dean at the time, Thomas Manis, was um, quite instrumental in getting the industry together to look at mass timber um, and, you know, to try to encourage uh, industry to jump in and uh, put in a, a mass timber production facility. Um, in the picture, you see my colleague Lech Mazinski from OSU Wood Science and Engineering, uh, who's done a, an awful lot of work on mass timber, particularly with lesser utilized species. And he's pictured here with Valerie Johnson, who's the uh, CEO of DR Johnson Wood Innovations. They became the first uh, certified uh, producer of, of cross laminated timber in the US in 2016. And um, the Tallwood Design Institute was founded just around the same time that all that was happening. And then we started to see buildings appear in Portland. So Albina Yard, uh, you know, one of the first dedicated CLT buildings in Portland, that's on the left. Um, and then Carbon 12, which uh, was designed by Path Architecture and built by Path, Architect Path Architecture's uh, developer um, construction uh, arm. And this is, uh, I believe, still, I don't know if we're, cover, if, we're if we can uh, count the uh, Milwaukee 23-story uh, tower yet. Um, but um, until very recently, until Milwaukee came along, this Carbon 12 was the tallest uh, wood building in the United States. It's a, a high-end condominium, beautiful, beautiful space inside. It really opened people's eyes to what's possible um, with mass timber. Um, Around uh, the same time, there was, uh, you know, a, a concept for a 12-story building called Framework that uh, won the U.S. Tallwood Building Prize. Um, that building did not ultimately go ahead, but the design and the the testing that was done around it inspired a whole lot of other buildings, um, and um, you know, organizations like like our like my own, the the Tallwood Design Institute was. Um, involved in a lot of uh, technical testing around the structural systems to be used in the building. Um, and that data has gone largely into the public domain and it's, it's been able to be used to validate other projects and obtain permits. So even though the building itself didn't go ahead, um, it, it acted as a, a really successful catalyst to kind of uh, drive the mass timber uh, on the West Coast. Another building started to go up, First Tech Credit Union, uh, designed by Hacker Architecture and built by uh, Swinerton Builders was um, really notable because it managed to achieve cost parity with uh, a comparable uh, steel system. Um, um, in fact, I think it achieved a 4% saving, even though the, the, uh, the contractor was building with mass timber for the very first time. So we're starting to see, you know, the cost efficiencies come into the, into the equation here. And then around the same time in 2018, Fred's Lumber Company invested, um, uh, I think to date they've invested almost $40 million in a state-of-the-art production facility in Lyons, Oregon, um, not far from Salem. And that is producing a brand new category of mass timber product called uh, the mass plywood panel. Um, that was developed in conjunction with uh, researchers at our institute uh, working to do some of the um, the pre-certification uh, testing and, and that kind of thing. And then um, on our own campus at Oregon State, uh, these buildings went up, the Oregon Forest Sciences Complex. So this is part of uh, Dean Manis's commitment to try to uh, demonstrate uh, what could be achieved in the sector and really kind of marrying those, um, you know, 
forest conservation values with the opportunity to create jobs um, both in the rural environments and also in the urban uh, design um, context. So um, on the, at the top of the screen, you see our new AA Red Emerson Advancement Products Lab going up. Um, the concrete you see there is just the uh, strong wall for the structural testing that we do. So you can see a better shot of that in the top right, but really um, the, the shell of the building, I mean, it's essentially a glue lamb uh, skeleton with uh, a mass plywood panel uh, sheathing and that structural sheathing on the outside. And um, that building went up very rapidly. It was the first commercial um, use of mass plywood panels um, to our knowledge. And uh, really it was quite exemplary in terms of um, the overall project. Um, the project on the bottom had a few more teething troubles. I'm sure some of you may be aware of, of those, but uh, ultimately we now have this beautiful um, exemplary mass timber building um, which is um, pictured bottom right, and you can see an interior shot there. Um, and that building is actually being used as a living laboratory. So we have some of our faculty have equipped the building with all kinds of sensors and they're tracking um, moisture, creep, um, you know, uh, variations in uh, the post-tensioning. It, it utilizes a really um, revolutionary uh, post-tensioned rocking wall system for uh, as a seismic solution as well. So that's gonna generate data for years to come. And then some other projects, district office in Portland built by Anderson Construction, Oregon Conservation uh, Center in Portland, uh, designed by Lever Architecture. Uh, Outpost, which just um, designed by Skylab Architecture and Hood River, which just won a uh, Woodworks National Design Award. Um, along with, um, I should mention that our, our own uh, uh, PV Hall building was also a winner there just recently. So. Um, and then the Adidas campus expansion in Portland. So you can see that there's there's been this kind of upswell of of uh, activity in mass timber in Oregon in the last few years. Washington State was similar, and I don't I don't, I don't have time to go into uh, all of the buildings and projects there, but um, you know um, there have been equal equally um, uh, active uh, mass timber sector in in Washington State during the time that. Uh, the events were happening that I just described in Oregon. So, um, you know, one thing that's notable um, in Washington state is that in 2019, they brought in a, a state piece of state legislation called the Clean Buildings Act and that um, the Clean Energy Act or the Clean Buildings Act. And, and what that does, it's a kind of a placeholder that says we recognize woods value as a sustainable solution for the built environment. And, um, perhaps paves the way for um, incentive programs for low carbon buildings, for example, to be introduced and that kind of thing. And I think that's a, something that could have, um, you know, great potential up and down the coast. And then of course, we shouldn't forget the market to the south. So we have, um, you know, this huge um, market of 40 million people um, south of Oregon. Um, and there's, tremendous interest in mass timber there, as you're probably aware. The tech sector has been uh, one of the drivers of that. You know, they're very keen to improve the sustainability profile of their built uh, environment and the, uh, you know, drive down the carbon footprint of things like data centers. Um, in 2018, the Joint Institute for Wood Products Innovation was launched. That's a kind of a joint um, initiative of the California Board of Forestry and CAL FIRE. And a big driver there was actually to reduce um, the, the effects of catastrophic wildfires by trying to, trying to find ways to use restoration timber um, for something that has commercial value. Um, going hand in hand with that in California, there are you know, the most ambitious uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets in the country um, for homes and also for non-residential construction, very ambitious targets to drive those down towards net zero within a very short space of time indeed. Um, and what, we've, what we're hearing from the uh, contractors and de designers that TDI uh, interacts with is that the California projects are, you know, developing a similar number but tend to be larger in scale. Um, so meaning that the, um, you know, the, the amount of fiber that's being used in those projects is really considerable. 
So of course we um, have had some building code changes as well in 2018, late 2018, uh, the, the Tallwood Buildings uh, Committee uh, proposed uh, three new mass timber building types to be actually brought within the, the model code of, of the United States. And we have these type 4A, B and C being introduced that can allow buildings up to, that should be 18 stories, I'm not sure whether it says 20, but um, you know, considerable buildings, and each of those are kind of based on on buildings that kind of already existed. You know, the the Type Four A was built was was based loosely on the the Brock Commons model up in Vancouver, BC. Um, the Type Four was was based loosely on the um, the twelve story uh, framework building, and so on. Uh, each have different levels of encapsulation uh, associated with them. Um, at the highest level, you're pretty much encapsulating everything uh, in fireproof material. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really um, significant that wood mass timber is coming into the building code in this, in the prescriptive code in this way. So where are we today in terms of the, you know, mass timber? So we, in terms of production facilities, it's quite um, notable when you look at the production facilities and the number um, in, in Western states and in British Columbia. So British Columbia itself has uh, you know, now four um, mass timber plants, it's Structure Lamb and Kalashnikov, the newcomer, uh, making CLT. Briscoe, a small company making a, an LVL-based uh, mass timber product, and Structure Craft making dowel laminated timber. Um, in Washington, we've had Katera and Wagen timbers come online in 2019, um, close to the border with BC. And then in Oregon, we mentioned D.R. Johnson and Ferrer's Lumber Company. You know, Montana, you know, our smart lamb has been around since 2017 and have significantly expanded their factory in 2020. Um, California has no facility to date um, producing panels, but has issued a, a request for, for proposals for a siting study looking at the best location for uh, that kind of uh, production facility. Um, you can see there's glue lamb in um, most of these uh, areas as well. Um, and then in, ter in terms of product, projects that are built or in design. Um, we don't have good numbers on the British Columbia side that are not being tracked as closely, but we have significant numbers of projects that are either built or in the design phase. Um, I wouldn't want to put a number there, but um, when we look at Washington, Oregon, Montana, California, um, we can see, uh, you know, projects, significant numbers of projects happening. And um, these are based on uh, the International Mass Timber Report produced by FBN and the Beck Group. Um, and then in terms of building codes, um, Washington and Oregon were the leaders within the U.S. in jumping on board with the new ICC wood, tall wood provisions and endorsing them uh, into their own codes pretty much immediately. Um, British Columbia has announced a new 12-story um, maximum for tall wood called encapsulated mass timber program and then uh, California is, is studying uh, those changes as well. So having you know set the scene there I, I, I want to sort of um, put out there this um, this concept that with all of the uh, you know the timber rich history of uh, this region and all of the activity that's taken place um, and the momentum that we have um, the time is ripe to consider this to be a, a regional mass timber cluster that could be, um, you know, competitive on a world scale. Um, and I, I look at the words of Michael Porter back in 2001 when he was looking at something called regional foundations of U.S. competitiveness and, and the idea of an industry cluster. And he says these things about clusters. So strong and competitive clusters are a critical component of a good business environment and are the driving force behind regional innovation and rising productivity. He then goes on to say, each region must craft a distinctive approach based on its unique and inherited assets. And we'll talk more about those inherited assets later. Um, building on an, traditional industri industries is a success, uh, has been a success um, strategy for clusters around the world. Um, and I think of the, uh, you know, the, the tremendous numbers of workshops that are grouped together in places like Italy around furniture manufacturing, for example. Um, 
So as he says that established and already emerging clusters offer the greatest prospects for near-term growth. And he also um, flags the importance of universities and specialized research centers to kind of help support and propel innovation um, and as well um, encourage entrepreneurship and, and the flow of new ideas. So let's look at those unique and inherited assets as in the context of the, the region we've just been discussing. So we have this rich history, these, these, this large forest land base, um, this history of the forest industry being a, a major economic driver. Um, we've seen that a high proportion of North American mass timber manufacturing is, is in this region. Um, we've seen strong R&D capacity and um, you know, a commitment from the states and, and um, British Columbia, province of British Columbia to support R&D work in this area of advanced wood products. And, and you know, fortunately, there's, there's been great political alignment on the environmental side all, all down the coast. You know, we've had uh, summit meetings of um, the governors and the uh, premier of British Columbia on, on environment. That's going back, um, you know, more than 10 years. And then we have this kind of 80-20 rule, and that's changing right now. But, you know, until recently, the growth that was happening across the U.S., um, the projects we were starting to see fan out into almost every state. Um, a lot of the, the Pacific Northwest firms were involved in that, you know, either on the design side, the structural engineering, or, or construction. Um, the, the, um, the knowledge base for mass timber is expanding and diversifying now, but um, we still see Pacific Northwest firms playing a, a really close role in a lot of projects. Um, and, you know, originally that was British Columbia firms, you know, doing, doing work down in Oregon. Now, then it became Oregon and Washington firms doing work across the country. And um, we're, we're seeing that the, the Pacific Northwest is playing this kind of pivotal role in the growth of mass timber around the country. We've done things like shared ideas on building codes. Um, Tallwood Design Institute a couple of years ago um, convened a meeting between uh, British Columbia permitting officials, uh, FP Innovations, the kind of national research, uh, forest research uh, agency up there, and our own officials here in Oregon, just to look at you know, how we can uh, facilitate um, the responsible and appropriate growth of these mass timber solutions. Um, California, a huge market potential, of course, um, could serve as a, as a driver on demand. Um, and then we have a lot of practical knowledge sharing already happening. Of course, the Mass Timber Conference that happens in Portland every year, well, did and, and will again, uh, was, a, was a huge driver of knowledge sharing. Our own uh, Tallwood Design Institute runs a, a meetup series that has now almost 700 members, and, and that's happened in just a couple of years. Um, so, so sharing knowledge and, and best practices up and down the um, region. And we have a history of regional cooperation. So the Pacific Northwest Economic Region, uh, PENWAR, has been around for a long time, and that's to um, facilitate cooperation between the Western uh, uh, provinces of Canada and the um, Western states of the US. So what's driving West Coast innovation today. Um, you know, firstly, you know, we talked about sustainability. I think the main driver behind a lot of the interest in mass timber in general has been this um, notion that it's a more sustainable product. It's got a lower carbon footprint. There's less embodied energy. Um, we're all familiar with that. Um, in on the West Coast, Silicon Valley in particular has been interested in that for reasons we already mentioned, driving down the greenhouse gas footprint of their data centers and offices. Um, perhaps on the West Coast, some of the, the, the climate change effects have been most, more visible in, in other areas of the world or in other areas of, of North America. Um, we've had these catastrophic wildfires that were really brought home um, the, the need to do something, the need to take action, and um, that's probably ingrained the sustainability and the importance of sustainability and of alleviate, alleviating climate change in people's minds here, maybe more than in other areas. Um, there's an urgent need to reduce the hazardous fuel buildup in national forests. And that's something that the Forest Service has been um, trying to address for years through their Wood Innovations Program. Um, there's been work done at uh, Oregon State and many other universities on uh, you know, using low diameter and yet lesser utilized species, because if we take 
if we thin the forest so that there's less of wildfire risk, what can we use that material for? We, we need to put it to productive use. And then, of course, um, around, the, around the country and around the world, but uh, particularly perhaps on the West Coast in cities like you know, San Francisco, uh, Seattle, Vancouver, we have a housing affordability crisis. And we, we're still trying to uh, crack the nut of how, how can we use mass timber, factor that into um, affordable housing solutions. But there, there's definitely a role for it. There's, there's a lot of sophisticated design work and intelligent thinking needs to be done around that. But I think um, uh, many companies are thinking in that direction. And um, that, that's definitely going to be a future driver uh, of, West, of uh, mass timber demand. And then, you know, we have these um, annoying challenges on the West Coast. We have huge seismic uh, challenges. We have, it rains a lot. Durability, uh, moisture related durability is a massive uh, question. Um, energy efficiency, uh, especially with the changes going, coming in in California um, and also in British Columbia. Um, these serve as drivers of innovation, you know, um, through necessity, uh, we need to address these issues. And I think in doing so, we've, in having to, to address these issues, we've, we've become highly innovative in mass timber in a very short space of time, in a way that perhaps it hasn't been necessary to do so in Europe. Um, and so that is perhaps part of the reason for us being able to kind of almost leapfrog to a, to a, uh, um, you know, a similar position to, to Europe in a much shorter space of time. And then, you know, uh, lastly, with the, the Biden administration uh, coming into power um, last month, we, we were seeing um, the promise of new legislation on, on climate and clean energy. And there's obviously, a, you know, a, an important role for mass timber and all of that conversation. I like to kind of show PV Hall, our own building, at Oregon State because um, there were definitely a lot of challenges to this project, but it was a great example of Pacific Northwest collaboration. So the architect and the structural engineering firm were, were from British Columbia, NGA Architects and Equilibrium Consulting. And uh, that was indicative of, you know, at the, the time the design started, there wasn't a lot of capacity um, in the US on um, designing these structures. There wasn't a lot of experience. Um, that's changed now. You know, today, if we were to build this um, building, it probably wouldn't be necessary to go to Canada for, um, for this kind of support. But um, the des design and, and engineering was done by um, BC-based firms. The construction was carried out by Anderson Construction, uh, an Oregon firm. Uh, the CLT and the glue lamb were fabricated at D.R. Johnson in Riddle, Oregon, Southern Oregon. Um, a lot of the sophisticated CNC fabrication of those were done at uh, Cut My Timbers, who have, you know, um, kind of world, world class experience in uh, mass timber fabrication. Um, and then some of the specialty connector fab and installation was done by StructureCraft in Delta, BC. So we had this whole, um, you know, supply chain integration up and down the, the I 5 corridor happening. I think that's just kind of indicative of, you know, uh, I, 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 one of the strengths of, of this region um, and mass timber developing in, his, you know, in tandem up and down the West Coast and, and the way that we could possibly move forward. I'll just kind of rant, start to come to a, a conclusion of this presentation by just briefly mentioning some of the outcomes of a, an analysis that we did uh, this past summer. This was um, a, a analysis of the Oregon mass timber manufacturing supply chain and really it was driven by um, uh, conversations with Business Oregon and others and, and people in industry around the first mover advantage that we've talked about that Oregon was able to secure by having the first mass timber manufacturing facility in, in the state. Um, we, the, the thought was that uh, Oregon had kind of secured this first mover advantage. And now it was a question of how do we maintain that, you know, in light of the investments in large scale production in, in uh, Washington state and other initiatives underway all around the country. Um, and so we looked at, you know, some of the barriers and challenges and opportunities um, really in this um, manufacturing part of the supply chain. So we weren't so much looking at forest management logging or construction, but 
the steps in between lumber milling, manufacturing, and fabrication. And some of the key takeaways from that, you know, some of the barriers that we felt would need to be addressed um, were firstly, you know, cost of equipment and facilities, you know, um, manufacturers of lumber who might be thinking about um, diversifying into mass timber, you know, there's obviously a capital equipment cost there. And there's a extreme volatility around log and lumber costs. And of course, lump, you know, lumber now being at an all time high um, is, is very illustrative of, illustrative of that. Um, labor was a huge issue. And um, in particular, you know, difficulty in sourcing qualified staff or any staff in some rural locations. Um, and, you know, aside from just um, sourcing the staff themselves, the, the skills that are needed in the timber and mass timber industry are quite different from lumber production. You have uh, a customized product versus a commodity product, and you have the need for uh, all kinds of other skills around um, CAD, CNC, um, and being able to, um, you know, integrate with uh, very closely with the other uh, people in the design team and, and so on. Um, you know, um, there was still some uncertainty over um, exact rates of adoption of mass timber in the market. And that has been complicated by COVID-19, of course. Um, I think generally speaking, considering this, the, the huge impact of COVID, um, the, you know, the rate at which projects have continued to, to move forward has been very encouraging, but um, we still have a situation where there's not really much consensus over how fast the market's going to grow and, and, you know, what kind of rate of adopt, you know, uh, what, what is going to be the market penetration of mass timber over the long term. So that leads to some uncertainty and some unwillingness to take risk. Um, fiber sourcing was another area that was highlighted, um, you know, in Oregon, for example, 80% of the harvested lumber currently comes from private land. Um, and I think, I think private forest land is only about 40% of the, uh, of the total, um, land base. So, um, you know, there's obviously people looking at um, could more um, fiber come off of um, federal forest lands, for example. And um, <clears throat> that leads back to the conversation about the, um, you know, the ability to do restoration uh, forestry and to reduce the uh, fire risk and at the same time um, create a fiber stream for for the expansion of mass timber. Um, some other small, uh, smaller, but, but still important uh, findings were around, you know, lumber sourcing and the challenges in finding, um, uh, you know, suppliers who could provide um, lumber dried down to 12% moisture content, which is obviously different from uh, the 19% that's the standard for construction lumber. Um, and then the existing lumber market is red hot. And so that, you know, serves as a, you know, uh, a barrier in that it's um, less appealing to jump into mass timber right now. Um, how can we, so, you know, kind of to round off here, how can we support the continued growth of the sector? Um, you know, we need increased mass timber supply. This is something we were hearing about a lot, especially a couple of years ago. And since then we've had this new capacity come on stream in the West Coast, um, Katera, Vagen, Kalashnikov. Uh, these are all new production facilities with significant um, increases in, in um, you know, supply uh, possibilities. And then we've had uh, SmartLam expanding as well, um, uh, quite significantly their production facility in Montana. So, um, so we're seeing new new production come on stream. That's much needed because um, lead time was a was a huge issue. Um, we're going to need to talk about increased fiber supply. Uh, we know that um, you know the sustainable forestry in North America is is in good shape. Uh, generally, we know that um, there is ample forest lands and working forest around to provide the fiber um, for many years to come. Um, there's some questions around whether uh, restoration forestry uh, could provide some of that fiber supply. Um, there are uh, a lot, there's a lot we can do in terms of workforce training. And uh, I mentioned previously that Tallwood Design Institute is working actively on that with uh, training in CAD, uh, computer aided manufacturing, and CNC, um, quality control, et cetera. And I think we need a holistic approach where we 
link from, from K to 12 and apprenticeships through community colleges and universities, because in each of those levels, there's something that could be a benefit for the sector. Um, we also need to encourage and support the growth of tertiary service providers. So not just panel manufacturers and glue line fabricators themselves, but the companies that do BIM modeling, the companies that do CAD detailing, the companies that do CNC fabrication, um, those are all really complex tasks and we need those kind of um, valuable, um, you know, currently quite scarce um, skill sets uh, to, to uh, avoid bottlenecks in, in our production. Um, there's various ways we can provide R&D support and this is, uh, you know, a central role of, of TDI and, and some of the other institutions around the country. And, and, and I think you know, there are possibilities around low carbon building incentives. Um, you know, can, can the state and other states uh, offer, um, you know, some kind of incentive for uh, a building that has a, you know, low embodied energy? And that could be done, of course, not just with wood, but with other materials and other solutions and um, probably more likely to succeed um, than something that's just about, you know, um, promoting more, more use of wood. So I hope that was uh, somewhat helpful and thought provoking. Um, wanted to thank Alex Zelaya, who did our supply chain analysis last summer, Evan Smith, my colleague at Tallwood Design Institute, Lynn Embry Williams from Woodworks in um, British Columbia, Susan Jones, uh, who's of course well-known architect in, uh, in Washington state, Greg Howes for the information you provided for this presentation in the past and also for organizing today. And, my colleague, uh, Michael Gershfeld, is an advisor to Tallwood Design Institute based in California. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can see the Zoom thing. And then if anyone has any questions, be happy to, uh, to jump into those. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Yeah, we do. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, I always learn a lot. There's just so much happening. Um, we do have some questions I'd, I'd like to read off for you, if you could answer. Sure. Um, from Shamnat Tajuddin, it's could you please explain the type of connectors used for these tall timber building systems? Um, probably not in the time we've got, and also I'm not a structural engineer. Um, some of my colleagues could do that far better than I could. Um, if you have specific questions though, and you'd like to uh, send an email, I'd be happy to get um, you know one of my colleagues to address that for you. But it it's a it's a big, huge question, and it really varies by by building. I think you know part of the Part of the way that we can achieve better cost efficiency in these buildings over the long term is to drive for standardized solutions to um, you know building design and that includes connectors um, it's quite common now for you know custom for connectors to be custom fabricated um, because you know the design teams are maybe doing this for the first time or or something like that and really what we need to drive to is is kind of proven um, set of solutions that work again and again um, there are there are some good resources to be had if you uh, look or contact companies like Rotoblast or um, MTC Solutions, who are you know are, are my tech who are all selling these kind of connectors. Um, we we've done a lot of work on on research different kinds of research on on connectors, but it's a very complex issue because you you know the interaction between the the materials you know the the, the the specifications of the panels themselves the 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 system you know the construction system that's used for the building those all factor in so um be happy to follow up though if you if you have you know uh if you'd like to send an email yeah the, the next question is from frank weeks what are your thoughts on the mass timber industry breaking into regions that do not have a strong history of timber how to retrain and evangelize local builders slash assemblers um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, in, in the areas that I've worked in more recently, that hasn't really been an issue. There has been a, you know, a tradition of building with timber, at least, at least single family homes. Um, and it's been more of a, I, I think, you know, that in the outside of the single family home and, you know, sort of four story walk ups, you know, once you get past that scale, we, we've sort of lost the ability to work with wood there. You know, you know and that's why we, we started to see um, certainly in Canada, when mass timber was just becoming more popular, the companies that would be drafted in to help install these, these buildings would be, um, timber frame companies. Um, and so, um, that is, you know, where the, 
you know, the, that sort of skill set around working with large pieces of wood um, still resides. And I think, you know, companies like Swinerton Builders, Anderson Construction are now, you know, really dialing in on how to, how to use wood. Um, so I think it's a challenge wherever you go. Um, I know that, you know, now we're seeing there's a, there's a CLT plant that opened just outside Cape Town in South Africa, and that's an area I've done a lot of work in, and it, they don't have a wood building culture. Wood, wood is seen as something that people build shacks with if they can't afford to build a real house, or, or uh, if you're on the other end of the scale, if you're very wealthy and you have a, you know, a holiday home by the sea, you might have a timber frame home, but um, between those two, there's, there's nothing, there's no tradition. And I, I think that would be really interesting um, to look at, but um, as I said, you know, when you're building large non-residential buildings, um, we don't have a build. We, have, we don't have a wood building culture um, in North America either. That that kind of left us a hundred years ago. So um, it's a it's a kind of a re-education process for everybody. Right, uh, and uh, another question. They're coming in. Um, Laurel Rec. Any movement by industry code officials or contractors in Alaska, given the compressed building season and the need for most materials to be shipped there? Unlike California or Oregon, Energy Code does not drive their decision making, but they sure have a lot of managed forest lands. Yeah, well, I've never traveled to Alaska, so I don't pretend to be an expert there, but I think um, we, we are in, involved in a project right now with the um, Cold Climate Housing Research Center in Alaska. And um, they have designed a, uh, an energy efficient building um, system called IGLU, spelled I-G-L-U. And um, we are working with them to look at sort of incorporating um, mass timber elements into that. Um, at the same time, um, you know, one, one of their first goal was to be able to kind of hone that system um, but a secondary goal is to start to work with uh, some of the fiber that's available, I believe in sort of the southeastern part of the state, um, and sort of to analyze its suitability for use in, in panels and that kind of thing. So there's kind of a two-stage two -stage process there, but there definitely is some interest. Right, and uh, Jordan Toes, you mentioned energy efficiency being an issue in need of resolution. Is there any insulative properties accepted for mass timber or is rigid exterior insulation or otherwise insulated exterior walls required to meet energy codes at this time? Yeah, generally, um, you know, there are some insulative properties, but generally you do need insulation. Um, and, you know, I, um, I did note that um, just uh, recently there was an announcement that there is a um, a wood fiber insulation company. Uh, it, there's a, a company setting up shop in Maine uh, to make wood fiber insulation, um, and they're considering other other U.S. locations. And that's based on technology developed in Europe that's being used uh, fairly widely there. Um, I think the potential is really good in the future to start to look at integrating those kind of insulation systems into panels. Um, you know, and uh, it makes sense to do it with a material that's sustainable and renewable like wood. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think where we are right now in terms of the, the technology of something like CLT, you know, we're really just in its infancy. There's, um, you know, it's amazing what, how uh, a fairly low tech pro product where you're just layering together pieces of wood at right angles with some glue has kind of revolutionized um, the the way we build and captured such uh, imagination in people. But I think we're just scratching the surface, and there's there's lots of things that can be done to integrate uh, insulation and smart sensors and other things into these into these wood products, so that we're really um, dealing with um, you know really compelling uh, opportunities in terms of the prefabrication, the labor saving on site. The ability to increase the the quality of our of our buildings. Yeah, there, there's quite a bit of chat going on regarding unmet needs or 
uh, new materials for like adhesives, water repellents, uh, fire treatments. Uh, can you give me a brief overview of that? Um, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the fire treatments, um, the, the charring behavior of, of mass timber has probably been the thing that we've um, you know, spent most time looking at just in terms of um, can we achieve the the life safety outcomes? You know, can we uh, can can the buildings be structural intact um, in the same way as other you know other buildings would be in 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 a way that allows people to leave the building and, and all of that? And we, you know, there's there's good good results on all of that stuff, and it's generally accepted that um, you know that that's a great solution. Um, um, Fire returns come with their own um, negative points as well in terms of you know off gassing and all of that um, and in a situation where they're you know in the presence of extreme heat um, that can be particularly um, dangerous so uh, again I'm not going to wait into this too deeply because I'm just going to get myself in trouble I'm not a, you know a chemical engineer or anything like that but um, these are things that we've we've been tossing around for sure um, and also the idea of um, you know we, we've got some work underway right now to look at um, using preservatives um, and then making CLT from the preserved lumber and then testing that for the same kind of structural values that we expect with um, you know non-treated wood just to, to make sure there's not going to be any delamination effects or anything like that um, because um, that will open up markets in you know areas that have uh, termite issues like Hawaii and and, uh, and other places. So um, the the testing continues to advance in terms of fire, in terms of um, you know preservatives and, and and all of that. And um, it's you know we we encourage people um, you know at TDI we always encourage industry to bring those kind of issues to us um, because we want to do the kind of work that's going to overcome those barriers and answer those questions. One more question. Um, how do you see the potential of sustainable building materials like rammed earth or adobe being integrated with timber in terms of improving insulation, especially in regions where you have soil with good compression strength? Um, yeah, I mean, I think those are I think there's there is potential um, whether that's um, and again that's not something I'm terribly familiar with um, uh, so it, it's a uh, I, I think there are there are a lot of elements of building design that that are site specific and climate specific and others um, so in certain cases that might be a, a viable solution I mean I think is in particular if people are are um, you know, really striving for the, you know, the best they can achieve in terms of sustainability and, and renewability. Um, again, I, I, I think that there's, you know, all buildings are hybrids. Um, you know, there's, all buildings contain, uh, to a certain extent, concrete, steel, wood, and it's a question of what's the appropriate mix of those materials to achieve the given, the given goals. Good, and I, I have a question yet. Um, I mean, one of my objectives of this event is get an exchange of ideas uh, also internationally. And since in the US, a lot of the factories that are manufacturing mass timber are using European produced CNC machines, often CAD CAM software that's European. Um, how do we get an exchange of ideas and processes happening more between not only the EU and the US and Canada, but just internationally? Well, I think, I think we have to look for the questions on which we, there's a mutual benefit. You know, um, for, um, Europe ha has been doing this a lot longer than we have. And so um, maybe there's been more in it for, for us in North America from these kind of exchanges than in Europe. Um, but I think, um, as, as I said, I think in some ways, because of the unique challenges that we've had to face in North America, um, you know, I, I think of you know the West Coast. You've got you've got moisture, you've got seismic, you've got you know these all these dif different issues. Um, we've had to maybe innovate really rapidly, and and um, I think in terms of the ways that we've dealt with, in particular, tall wood buildings, um, some of the solutions that have been developed here 
have been, you know, we've been doing things in sort of this, this rapid innovation and iteration. Um, and, and we've, we've managed to do this at a fairly rapid pace. And I've, I've heard other people say similar things. So um, I think we're at the point now where um, we can really learn from each other. You know, there are, I mean, one, one area I, I often think of is in terms of um, building durability and, and, you know, people ask us questions about the longevity of these buildings and, and what kind of problems are going to appear down the line, if anything. And we, you know, we, we don't have a very long history in any of these buildings here. We have longer history in Europe. So, you know, the, er, the whole area of structural monitoring and evaluation and durability is something I think there's really good um, lessons we could learn. Um, in terms of technology, yeah, you're right. I mean, um, we all know that most of the, the machines, the CNC machines and a lot of the programs are, um, have, have come from Europe. Um, I think, you know, software wise, we're going to be developing quite rapidly our own solutions. I've heard talk about, you know, direct links between Revit and, uh, you know, CNC machines that are, you know, you know starting to, to be developed. Um, that could kind of revolutionize that space. Um, manufacturers like USNR on the West Coast are, are putting in CL, uh, CNC lines, not CNC lines, but uh, CLT presses and the like. So, um, you know, as, as the market here becomes large and, um, you know, more European companies have a presence here, um, I think we're automatically going to see those kinds of conversations happen. Um, but I think there, there is, we are getting to the point where we can, there's a, there's a real kind of like two way interaction where we can both benefit. Right. Yeah. I, I think the same. I mean, since, as you know, work with a Swiss business partner, I think the demand is just so extreme. We kind of can't keep up. So there's kind of enough work out there to do for essentially everyone. Just a view. Um, how do we, here's a, a final question. We take an hour of your time. If people want to follow up with you and Tallwood Design Institute, uh, what's the best way to get a hold of you or just connect with you? Yeah, well, we have a um, probably the easiest way is at our um, TDI at OregonState.edu. Oregon State, one word. So TDI <clears throat> at OregonState.edu. You know, or visit our website um, um, or our, um, you know, I encourage you, if you're interested in, um, hearing more about the research we do to join our, our mass timber meetup group. It's called Critical Mass Timber. And um, we often do research briefs where we'll try to, um, you know, update our, our audience on, um, you know, work that's just been completed. Um, so um, we, we have that, that group, as I said, has grown to about 700 people quite rapidly over the last couple of years. And we'd love to uh, have more people join in that conversation. Great. Well, any other final comments? Um, you've covered a lot of territory. <laughs> yeah, perhaps too much. Um, <laughs> no, no, thanks for the opportunity. Um, and um, you know, I also would like to acknowledge the, the US Forest Service support of this whole event and, and thanks to you for, uh, for organizing. Sure, thank you so much and uh, look forward to the next conversation. Uh, I'm working with you. Tomorrow's uh, presentation is by Will Novi Hildesley on mass timber and climate change. Hope you can join us and thank you, Ian. Thank you. Thank you, audience. See you tomorrow.